All right, with that, let's turn to our last message with uh, the topic of fear. So uh, the sermon title this week is No God, I'm sorry, No Fear, No Fear, The Fear of the Lord. In the summer of 1994, so I was alive but not too terribly old, uh, great fires ravaged the western part of Washington. Months of little to no rainfall happened, and it turned the, the state into a vast tinderbox. Then, to add insult to injury, a series of electrical storms happened. Heat lightning struck at random, and fire began along the ridges and up the valleys. Firefighters responded for the call of help. Helicopters, special tanker planes, bulldozers, every possible means necessary was utilized to keep towns, ranches, and vacation homes safe from the path of fire. But in the end, it was the oldest method that was used in order to save these places. Fighting fire with fire. Backfires were started that burned down the fire lines and onrushing forest flames. When the great fires came to this territory that had been burned by backfires, they ran out of fuel and died. The Word of God uses a similar technique. The fear of the Lord is the answer to the problems we face when our other fears get out of control. As we learn to follow Jesus in every area of our lives, we become adept at fighting fear with a greater holy fear. In Psalm chapter 34, King David issues an invitation. Come, my children, listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. To more adequately understand the wisdom David is offering us, we need some context. David was not yet established as king, but he had been anointed by Samuel and was well aware of the advantage that he was soon to have. He had already proven to be a courageous warrior by defeating Goliath. And then, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, the women would shout as they would come through the village, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. These accolades offended Saul so much, and that he had such resentment and animosity that he attempted to kill David out of jealous rage. David fled to the wilderness without equipment, without provisions. Out of this fear that plagued him, he fled to the land of the Philistines. There, in the court of his very enemy, he was recognized and captured. He knows what's going to happen to him. So what does he do? He pretends to be mad. He grovels and crawls, screams, cries, and even scratches the wall and drooling all over himself. The king is so disgusted that he turns David loose. David flees to the cave of Adullam. And it is here, by himself, that we read our passage today, which is in Psalm chapter 34. And we're going to pick up in verse 3. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord exalts him. The angel of the Lord encamps 
around those who fear him, and he delivers him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. The only adequate way to overcome the fears of the flesh is with the fear of the Lord. So what does the fear of the Lord mean? What does it look like? So first of all, the fear of the Lord rightly places Jesus as Lord and Master of our lives. Theologian Oswald Chambers once said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas, if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Here it is vital to pause and understand what is meant by the fear of the Lord. Because humans are prone to transfer things. So we, we naturally transfer what we see around us, amongst men, and transfer it onto God and onto our culture. And things that we see in our culture we transfer. So our perspective, I believe, of what the fear of the Lord is has been misconstrued. Now in this passage, the main Hebrew and Greek words that are translated fear are, uh, have several shades of meaning. But in the context, this fear is a positive reference, a positive reverence, excuse me. So here's a couple of Hebrew words for you that are in this passage. The first one is yare, and it means to fear, to respect, to reverence. And the second word, which is a noun here, yira, which refers to the fear of God, and is viewed as a positive quality. This fear acknowledges God's good intentions. This fear is produced only by God's word, and it's used in order to make a person receptive to the wisdom and knowledge that God gives. The Greek noun phobos, I'm sure you guys are familiar kind of with that for phobia, but phobos can mean reverential fear. Not a mere fear of his power, of God's power, but a wholesome dread of displeasing him. 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas puts it this way. I'm going to use a, word, a couple words I honestly hadn't been very familiar with, so I will explain what they are. But fear of God, if you don't know, fear of God is a filial fear. That was a new word to me. But uh, like a child's fear of offending his father rather than a servile fear that is a fear of punishment. If you understand fear, you understand there's a difference there. There's a fear between wanting to not offend someone who you know loves you, absolutely, versus a fear of you don't want to get caught, you don't want to get punished. The fear of the Lord is the absolute assurance that a child has in a good father. And for the Christian, this means we may live freely as children because we have complete confidence that is rooted in respect for the character and word of our perfectly loving father. It is not like a slavish, cringing fear. It is a simple belief that God governs our every aspect for goodness and love. And so we fear to trust anyone else because we know he wants what's best for us. When Jesus is our Lord and Master, we are freed from the power of sin, but we become bond slaves to Christ. 
Among others, Paul and James refer to themselves as doulos. The Greek word doulos means someone who belongs to another, a bond slave without any ownership rights of their own. Now here's another example where we need context here. Because the modern use of the word slave has been a person with no dignity. And yet that is not what the word doulos implies. Ironically, it is used with the highest dignity in the New Testament. Namely, of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his holy, devoted followers. So, if we're to modernize what he's saying, he's saying not only are true Christians no longer enslaved to sin and enslaved to the fallen world, we willingly and even joyfully surrender our will that desires that we be in charge to live under Christ's perfect will and authority. That's tough. You know, we're, we're very quick to give up control of the things that are obvious, but the little things where we just hang on to control because we think we know what's best. But because we know that we want nothing more than to please our loving Father, we need to know what that looks like. In John chapter 14, we read Jesus say, if you, love, yeah, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And in John chapter 15, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed in my Father's commands and remain in his love. God loves to relate to those he leads. That's why we can trust him completely. Now, for those of you that have Facebook or kind of follow, this week I, I gave a little tease about God's love language. So if you're familiar at all, and I, I honestly don't remember who the author is, maybe Gary, <laughs> Gary Chapman, about the five love languages. And so I teased with, uh, we don't think about what God's love language is. How is God best loved, in a sense? And what we learn from this is that God's love language is obedience. Don't believe me? Go read those verses again. God feels love when he is obeyed. To profess love in God and to refuse to obey him is to communicate opposites. We see this play out in human families all the time. Parents measure their love by their children's obedience. When children happily trust that their parents want what's best for them, <coughs> they relax into their parents' authority, and love flows freely. The attitude of submission towards a trustworthy leader causes the love relationship to flourish between the leader and the follower. If a child says, I love you, but consistently violates your instructions, you would be right to, to maybe call into question the authenticity of their verbal profession. In this case, the child has a self-centered idea of love that is not genuine. I, I liken this a little bit to what we see in politics. That you hear, you know, that they're trying to get what they can to please you, to get your vote, rather than necessarily following through. It's like a child who says, I love you, but doesn't follow what you're doing. There's, there's childish behavior right there. It's self-centered, self-seeking. But when we truly and rightly understand that good and loving authority comes only from God, we are free to live from his pleasure. I love the fact that God is in control of my life. There's freedom in that. That the, all of the mistakes I know that I would make, I can lift it up to him because he loves me. 
Secondly, the fear of the Lord turns us from our evil ways. A.W. Tozier was quoted as saying this. This is another just great quote. came across some great ones this week. But when men no longer fear God, they transgress his laws without hesitation. The fear of consequences is no deterrent when the fear of God is gone. In Proverbs chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 6, and then skip to 9 through 11, we read this. My son, if you accept my words and store up, in my, store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. And so what we see is it is our fear of God that leads us to doing what is right. Some people will say it's their conscience, it's the fear of God that causes us to do what is right. But what does God have to say for those who choose to scoff at his authority? Does it really matter? Can't we just live life apart from his authority? So let's consider Romans chapter 1 and how it parallels what we are seeing going on in our country today. Paul paints a clear picture in chapter 1 of a trajectory with which one's life takes, but more significantly, the trajectory of a culture where the fear of the Lord is absent. Paul is going to give us here in Romans 1 an overview or a quick look into the wrath of God. So initially what we read is that people deny God even though all of the evidence is laid out clear as day to see. But after that, after the denial takes place, what is next is that God is being replaced through idolatry of people and things found in nature or in his creation. Now when you speak of the, of the wrath of God, Scoffers usually laugh at you, and they believe, maybe not outwardly, but inwardly, uh, believing that they've been validated because I have not been struck down. Yet pay attention to what Paul says next. Paul writes, therefore, so as a result of replacing God with idols, therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity. What a surprise it is to find that the wrath of God while we are here on earth is that God lets us go to the way that our hearts desire. It doesn't feel like wrath, where we expect God's wrath to be harsh, immediate punishment. I was sitting in my lawn chair, uh, I think probably Wednesday or Thursday this week, and God popped into my mind the thought, the idea of boiling a frog. I didn't actually do it. <laughs> but that was placed in my mind. And so if you know this idea of boiling a frog, if you take a frog and stick it in, a, in boiling water, the frog's going to jump out because it realizes that it's, it's in an environment that's not right. It's going to die. But if you stick a frog in lukewarm water, and gradually turn up the heat, its body adjusts to the point where it will stay in there and it'll boil and die. Unless, unless some outside source, a person, comes in and saves them. A person who denies God is just like the frog in that second situation. They're unable to acknowledge that they are storing up eternal wrath. They can't see what's coming down the road 
Because they allowed gradually this process of deception to take place. And what in the past would have been abhorrent has now become normal. And now are accepted and then normal. And so they can't see the eternal wrath being stored up, which is hell, unless they turn to Jesus. Because he is the only one that can save them. He is the only one that has saved us by plucking us out of this boiling water. The inevitable result of God letting people go their own way is always that one sexuality becomes a primary point of rebellion. Now it may shape or form itself in different ways based on the individual, but culturally speaking, throughout the course of history, it reveals itself in much the same way. When someone removes themselves from God's supervision, they take over the management of their own bodies. And so those, it let, those that are living in rebellion can't help resisting this freedom, making up their own sexual rules. In today's world, one thing that you can say to provoke in some kind of an explosive reaction is to question whether or not someone has the right to do whatever they want with regard to their sexuality. It'll emit some kind of a response, like, quit it with your old-fashioned morality. Who, you know, it's, it's none of your business what I choose to do, or with whom I choose to do it. It's my body, not yours. The next step is sexual deviancy. We see that God gives them over to the shameful lusts and that men and women exchange natural heterosexual relations with unnatural homosexual relations. At this point, man is leaving, living in defiance of God's created design that provokes not only immorality and promiscuity, but also the loss of sexual identity. From this results a radical, defiant rage that screams, I'm going to do whatever I want with whomever I choose to do it. And don't you even suggest that I'm wrong. Yet Paul says this is not the final step. God then gives them over to the depraved mind. The depraved mind means that one's thinking is turned upside down. Not only have they forsaken truth, they can't tolerate it. This leads to a belief system where not only does one follow their own preferences and goes with what feels right to them, they encourage others to do the same. Anything seen as authoritarian or absolute is regarded as ignorant <coughs> or at least some kind of superstition. To this, God says in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. They live in utter darkness. It hardly seems necessary for me to even bring this up again, but to, to even ask the question where you see this country in lieu of, chap of Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 describes a predictable pattern seen throughout recorded history of the results seen in a society under the wrath of God. Yet scripture reveals that there is a light that can pierce the darkness no matter how dark. So finally, the fear of the Lord initiates the only path to a fruitful kingdom community, i.e. the local church. So we talked about kind of the negative, what happens when you, when you uh, dismiss the fear of the Lord. What happens within the life of a church when that fear of the Lord is present? What attributes must be present in order for a church to be fruitful and healthy? Because as we read in, or as we read in Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the path of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. 
Thus, our understanding of anything must come from obedience to God's word rather than our own opinions. We have already stated that we show God love through our obedience. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what does obedience look like to God, and am I being obedient? Consider the following passages. In 1 John chapter 4, we love because he first loved us. And in Colossians chapter 3, forgive as the Lord forgave you. At the end of the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples to go out, teaching others to observe all that I have commanded you. So our obedience is a reflection of who God is to reveal God's nature before all men. A fruitful church begins with the hearts of those in the body. It begins with having the wisdom to understand who we are or who we were when we didn't have Christ's authority in our lives and how the presence of unrepented sin affects and poisons not only our own heart, but it plagues the local church. When we live disconnected from Jesus, the vine, our hearts are filled with, the, with, the, um, with pride, lies, immorality, idolatry, and anger. If you ask a group of strong-willed people, I can be strong-willed at times, I can admit that, uh, and if you're control-hungry, if you try to ask them to come to a consensus about something, it's going to end up with disaster because they're all fighting for what they want endlessly. But with Christ, we are to put off the old self and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of our Creator. Brothers and sisters, we need to die to ourselves daily and live humbly for Him. But the reality is, is that the old self dies hard. A healthy church is one where the significant majority of people, and I do think this maybe is a, a, a more of a struggle within local bodies, is a significant majority of people serve without their egos needing to be soothed. They have committed themselves to living in humility with each other, working in harmony for his goals, which are always higher than our own. When most of the church is humbly living for Christ, there's a beautiful fragrance. What is that fragrance? It's the sweet smell of the fruit given to us by the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. When you come across people like this, it is, it is refreshing because their only agenda is that of growing God's kingdom for his glory. The light I referenced earlier that pierces any darkness is Jesus through the repentance of our sins and allowing God his rightful place as Lord and Master of our lives. Repentance always comes before obedience. Repentance always comes before revival. How many of us have prayed for revival? Yet we cannot truly pray for revival if we will not repent. When we disobey God, we must come before him and repent and allow him to change our ways. I am very convinced that many in the church have fallen prey to the idea of self-help, that we can fix our own problems, that we can make our lives the best they could possibly be. These are outrageous lies. Without repentance, there can be no revival of the heart or a revival of a culture. So if you are out there praying for a revival of the American way as you've known it, 
but you're unwilling to repent for your role in that, there will be no revival. Revival starts with repentance of the heart. But when we repent, we allow God his rightful place on our heart's throne. One closing story. It's a favorite of mine. It's uh, in regards to the end of World War II. Uh, the Japanese had just formally, or had, had informally surrendered, and so they were going through the process of, of officially uh, declaring the, the war over with, with Japan. And so General uh, Douglas MacArthur, who was the representative for the United States, and an admiral, a high-ranking admiral for the Japanese Army, boarded uh, a U.S. military ship, the battleship Missouri. And so as the ceremony came to the actual moment of surrender, the Japanese admiral stepped forward and extended his right hand, which was a formal way of declaring that the hostilities had ended. But MacArthur refused it. He kept his hand at his right side. Sternly, he said, Sir, your sword first, please. Only after the defeated admiral handed over his sword did MacArthur take his hands. Why did MacArthur ask for the sword? Because the formal disarming of the enemy was a symbol of surrender. Until the weapon was handed over, hostilities had not formally ceased. God is after a similar response. He calls it repentance. Biblical repentance. By the way, this is, I was, when I came across this, you know, this kind of, you know, probably a few years ago, it was like my eyes were open to my, my lack of understanding about re what repentance is. Because as a society, like within our homes, when we ask our kids to repent for what they've done, we do it so poorly. So listen to this part. Biblical repentance means so much more than being sorry or even shedding tears for it. True repentance means the arrival of God's kingdom. Ultimate authority has arrived, and you have a choice to fight against it or lay down your arms and surrender to him. And that's a scary thought, because we look at the leadership with which we have, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a parent that you, that you, that you wish had never been your parent. Or maybe it was a local a leader, or a police officer, or maybe it was a governor, or whatever it may be. And you think, I could never dare give everything over and totally trust, because they're going to take advantage of me. But this is God. It's time to lay down any arms that you still hold on to, that are resisting God's, life, God's control in your life. Will you give up your resistance and bow to the King of Heaven? Will you give up whatever sword you may be hanging on to and obey him in some area of your life? Because we cannot battle the fears that we face, like what we talked about the last five weeks, with any man-made weapon. Our swords are useless. And so we are reminded that the only adequate way to overcome the fears of the flesh is with the fear of the Lord.